Good morning to the Americas. Good afternoon from Amsterdam and good, good evening to the participants in Asia. Welcome to my webinar, Leadership Team Coaching with Emergenetics and Building Highly Effective, High-Performing Leadership Teams. So as Ron said, my name is Elizabeth van Gierstein, and um, I have the uh, pleasure of being the, a managing partner at Papillon and Partners based in the Netherlands, together with our global network of coaches. We coach senior executives and leadership teams in Europe, Asia, North America, and Latin America. I'm a self-professed uh, lifelong learner, and uh, to that end, I'm also adjunct professor of personal leadership development for MBA programs at the Rotterdam School of Management here at our Erasmus University in, in Rotterdam. So, as I mentioned, I will be talking leadership team coaching with Emergenetics. And our navigation for today is a little bit like this. I'd like to set the scene, tell you a little bit about the teams that I coach and the challenges they face, and also take you through in terms of how Emergenetics plays a role and our coaching approach and how we go about building strong teams with the aid of, of Emergenetics. So I'm often getting asked, what is the difference between leadership and management? And we like to answer that professional leadership is to have the right balance between management and leadership. Sometimes the leader of the group is not the same person as the manager. So what we actually mean by professional leadership is to balance and be skilled in both management and leadership which also makes managers leaders. On the other hand, a manager cannot just be a leader. He needs, uh, depending on the situation, you need to sometimes act more managerial and sometimes more, more with leadership. The main objective with management is to maximize the output of the organization through administration and implement, administrative implementation, such as organization, planning, staffing, directing, and controlling. Whereas the main objective with leadership is to maximize the output of the organization by emotionally involving people. And to achieve this, leaders must work with a lot of communication and motivation, putting their own core values and understanding others and building trust the whole time. Well, we, um, I think that's evident to everyone that increasingly organizations are operating in an environment of continuous change and sometimes discontinuous change, depending on the complexity of the operation and the amount of change needed, the manager needs to act differently. If there's low complexity and a low amount of change, then neither a lot of management nor leadership is required. And that's looking at our lower left-hand box. But increasingly, the organizations we coach are operating in areas of high complexity. So uh, complex technology, diversity, culture, geographic dispersion, continuous product development or service optimization. And they're operating in an environment that requires continuous, discontinuous change, reorganization and organization. And that means that our leaders our executives have to be have to operate with considerable leadership and considerable management. I mentioned that our companies, our executives operate in an environment of continuous change. And so change management is really quite a buzzword. 
However, one of the things we like to communicate is that, you know, think transition. It's never going to be, we're no longer in a situation where the change is finished and then we'll, we'll rest a bit. But if we change our paradigm to really view businesses today as in a constant state of change, so we're constantly being and becoming, ending situations, letting things go, and taking on new things, constantly in change and, and transition. So what does that mean for the executive? Well, if you talk to a number of executives today, I think will describe their working environment as a little bit of a roller coaster. And their feelings will merge depending on where they are in the, in the change cycle. Their feelings will, will merge between frightened, depressed, anxious, through to opportunistic, creative, disorientation, and right through to celebrating successes and a new vision or a new start. front if we're leading a team or leading anyone we might find ourselves at any stage of the curve and even more interesting we may we may also find also at any stage of this curve and the key to being able to motivate and to lead them is to understand where they are and how to engage how to engage with them how to how to move with them Another interesting dynamic that we call is that most of us grew up, most of us grew up in the land of hierarchy and control, which is a pretty standard organizational chart. We see where everyone is, we know where everyone belongs, and we have pretty clear accountabilities. However, in our complex interconnected global world today, most of our organizations have become flat or matrix organizations. And so our companies look like this and our reporting and hierarchical dotted lines and solid lines are sometimes quite a maze in itself to navigate through. Now, I, I must apologize. I'm sorry if you're seeing a kind of grid patchwork. That's currently what I'm seeing on my screen, but I'm hoping that you're getting the full So organizational realities, just to recap, and just to summarize that, our organizations are flatter, more matrixed, navigating reporting lines are more complex. We have multiple assignments, multiple teams, often multiple bosses. Our businesses are global 24-7 and we follow the sun and sometimes we have the sun and the moon and all at once like we have now in this webinar. And our teams are cross-cultural, functional, cross-generational, virtual. And so effective collaboration today is a very distinct skill set together with the effective skill set of teamwork. So that's kind of emergenetics begins to come into the picture for us. Our leadership scope tends to be four dimensional. We always start at the core and we believe that the core of leadership is personal leadership. It's leading yourself and then going on from having a strong sense of who you are, what you believe in, what your values are, your strengths, your blind spots, your limitations, your vision, moving on to leading others, the, your ability to influence and to move others and to interact effectively and engage effectively with others. A, fourth, a third dimension is leading teams, those teams that, that report to you or whom you're, you are leading, cross-cultural, cross-virtual, cross-functional, or even cross-generational, or four of those things, all of those things, and then leading your organization. Our executives can find ourselves having any one or even all four 
of these dimensions operating out of all four of these dimensions. And so that's why, why we like to refer to our leadership development and our coaching programs as leadership being very much an inside out process, starting with the individual, but it's absolutely not a solo event. And then moving on to the team or the others you influence. But the true effectiveness comes when we're able to effectively align the best of what we have, including vision, direction, focus, core competencies, capabilities, together with others. And so as an organization, as a high performing team, we start to do the heavy lifting to the degree that we're able to align and work effectively and think and believe effectively with each other. And this is where Emergenetics really comes in for us. Right at the beginning of our coaching team engagements, our team coaching engagements, we always do an Emergenetics assessment of every team member, but also an Emergenetics team profile. And it's important for us to understand what's the neurodiversity in the room. And also if, this, if the team were a brain, how would they be thinking based on their um, thinking and their behavioral attributes? And we've had some really interesting situations. So I remember once in one, with one of my engineering teams, in our first session, before the team got together as part of their pre-work, they had all completed the Emergenetics ass Assessment as well as some other assessments. And when we debriefed, the majority of the team was left brain and with just one who had, uh, just two who had a social, uh, um, a social preference and this was reflected also in their MBTI profiles. And so one of the team members said, oh, it's great to see that we're a team without feelings. So I guess we could really become a high performing machine. Now they really laughed about that, but that kind of tells you, shows the level of their uh, joking ability. So we're having a lot of fun in that team and the Emergenetics was a huge eye opener enabling us and particularly the team members as a team to recognize how they can consciously move and step out and step within their preferences and also step out of their preferences to engage each other more effectively, to be more conceptual, to give more room for what they previously perceived as chaos. We've also, we also said, with mindfulness techniques to move uh, in this particular team to help them further develop and to feel more comfortable in the conceptual space. So that's uh, some of the ways always at the beginning we'll be starting off with in the Imaginetic space. And, and what we do is we look to various team challenges, uh, team objectives. So for example, one of my teams is, is uh, involved in a 25 million euro capital project, others in uh, uh, triple digit million euro capital projects. And so we look at what, what each milestone requires in terms of thinking and behavioral attributes. And we consciously step out to ensure that these are fulfilled so the best objectives are achieved. Just a short recap on those four dimensions that I mentioned at the beginning, which form our coaching focus. Right at the core is leading yourself, which is understanding personal values, goals, personal vision, maximizing strengths, focusing on the powerful combination of uh, top strengths and, and core competencies, understanding what our potential derailers are, our blind spots, 
mixing all that and leveraging the benefits of our personality, whether we are extrovert or introvert or anything in between. And beginning also to understand emotional intelligence and social intelligence, leading ourselves, influencing others. Someone once said, and I love to repeat it, that your leadership rises and falls on your level of influence. And for this, leveraging emotional intelligence is key. That's very much about leveraging different leadership styles, situational leadership, engaging in a, in a connected way of uh, giving and receiving feedback, advocacy, putting forward your opinions, your viewpoints in a way that can be heard by others, being curious, inquiry, asking questions, coaching, mentoring, building positive relationships, and being inclusive with all types of diversity. Again, here, leading others and leading self, we find that emergenetics is absolutely key to assisting executives to take their leading of themselves and also their leading of others to a higher level. To them. Just looking at some of the principles of collaborative leaders that we also um, really coach on and, and which we, this is the essence of draw, that I've drawn out of several of our coaching engagements. The first four really deal with leadership communication, interaction, building relationships, generating trust, helping to change viewpoints, the what's in it for me, helping others see their common interests and their payoff from joint efforts. Further principles of collaborative leaders consist of helping to design a transparent, credible process, whatever you're doing with the team, assisting in win-win negotiations, allowing all partners to win, or as we also like to say, allowing all partners to gain, so gain, gain relationships. Further principles of collaborative leaders um, involve making relation building a priority. And this sounds really simple. However, when you're involved in making things happen, time is limited, money is tight, stakeholders are anxious, then it's often so much easier to focus on deliverables, focus on tasks and activities, and not on relationships. And yet, the inability to manage relationships cause over 52% of alliance failures. And how many times have you met other executives that leave their jobs because they couldn't get on with others, significant stakeholders that they needed to work with within their organizations? So some examples of collaborative leaders include uh, having shared leadership, facilitating collaborative problem solving. Here again, we find emergenetics so useful and so valuable for being able to mine the intelligence in the room. And not just IQ, but for example, spatial intelligence, analytic acumen, so many other ways of looking at things. Uh, creative, artistic intelligence. How do we get that out of the room? And also socially taking the lead to celebrate successes. So I mentioned earlier in my webinar, the engineering team that I coach, and it has been quite an attention point to focus on celebrating small successes that lead up to large successes. This team is so driven that they often forgot or just simply overlooked to take the time to pat themselves on the back 
and also pat each other on the back as they were meeting milestone after milestone after milestone and and deadline after deadline after deadline. So our awareness on our thinking and behavioral um, attributes also serve to generate trust. As trust is generated, as our relationships become safer, we grow in our confidence, in our personal confidence, in our confidence in the collective team, and a sense that the other team members have my back. As that grows the hope that we're going to make it, and also our resilience, our ability to overcome setbacks grows. And, and I've seen teams go from teams that had a very strong blame culture, increase in resilience and go move into a can-do team, one that wasn't afraid of challenges, one that embraced failure as a means of learning and stepping up and getting stronger together. Those were the 11 principles of leaders that we work through, that we coach through in our teams, in our coaching engagements, which last anything from six months to 18 months. In those engagements, we, ca we coach the individuals one-on-one -on -one, and we also coach the team as a collective, as, a, as an entity. We see this has a wonderful cascading effect as individual team members take what they learn back to the teams that they lead and we get a cascading ripple effect, ripple down effect as the leadership team and the leadership capability increases throughout the organization. Now, a short while ago, I also mentioned building trust. Emergenetics is a key resource for enabling my teams and my team members to better align and alliance and work with their stakeholders. So we use it very much in our stakeholder analysis and our stakeholder management. So first of all, for individuals, for their individual objectives, but also for team objectives, we always plot a stakeholder map. And the team is able to uh, really uh, get in inventory the list of the most important stakeholders uh, who influence the project and the team in a 360 way. And we plot them on the map. As you can see here, on the lower left-hand corner, low power and low interest. These are stakeholders that we monitor and, and inform. They're actually less interested in our project and we uh, do not overwhelm with excessive information. Moving across those stakeholders that have low power but are interested in the project, we keep them informed and we keep engaged with them to ensure there are no issues, no major issues arising. And then we have our high power, highly high power, less interested people. And these we engage with enough effort to keep them satisfied to ensure continuous alignment. We also have, we also have on the top right corner, high power, high interested people. And these, we fully engage in participatory, inclusive, trust-based relationships. And here we find also that Emergenetics is crucial to enable us to keep our stakeholders satisfied and to manage them closely. By the way, by power, I don't just mean hierarchical, hierarchical power. I'm talking about power in five different ways. So relationship power, it's not who you know, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Hierarchical power, their position in the organization. Task power. Then we also have knowledge power. And then we have personal power. So those, that's uh, hopefully you've got a, a sense of how we've used Emergenetics to lead teams and the various ways it shows up and also 
how we are able to align our executives to increase their job satisfaction and their job contribution. So this brings me to the summary, the characteristics of an effective team, clear purpose, clear roles and work assignments, decision-making ability, engagement and participation, shared leadership, active listening, open communication and trust, embracing healthy conflict in our communication, leveraging our diversity, coaching and feedback, informality, and stakeholder analysis and stakeholder management. For especially points number three to number 12, the emergenetics analysis assessment understanding comes back time after time after time. So summarizing, well, change is here to stay and it's absolutely challenging, but we can become masters of change. We're continuously managing multiple complex systems. We play to our strengths and in making, in translating strategy into action and project management, in making decisions and in monitoring organizational performance. And Emergenetics plays a key role in engaging and influencing our key stakeholders and leading all kinds of changes through successful transition. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to receiving your questions. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be on the webinar. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for this uh, excellent presentation, very insightful and um, a subject I think that is of critical importance for in today's um, um, a crisis situation where companies are. And um, so I think it's uh, very important. I have a question from the audience. Um, and the question is, when someone is a good manager, what behaviors tend to be the hardest to achieve so that they can also become a good leader? And, and uh, another question after that is, how do you help them bridge this gap? Thank you, Ron. That's a that's a fabulous question, and one that we and a, and a situation that we absolutely regularly encounter. When someone is a good manager, they've been recognised for being for consistently delivering results, and in many ways for acting as a, a senior supervisor, being able to have very good one on ones with people that report to them, or those that. Uh, that they're engaged with. And so they're often promoted into a leadership role, which really means beginning to align and engage with wider influence and to deliver tasks, deliver deliverables that do not depend solely on the stellar performance of the manager. So it's critical that they begin to shift their thinking. They begin to move to, to think like a leader, to begin to move away from achievement, an achievement-based focus and move into a catalytic focus where they are beginning to articulate a vision with the stakeholders involved, where they're beginning to influence at a completely different level, almost to raise the, the level of engagement and participation of others. How do I bridge the gap? How do we bridge the gap? How can they bridge the gap? Continuously looking at building trust with multiple stakeholders, continuously looking at showing up differently. It's no longer about their results. It's about making the shift from me to we and from them to us. And that begins as an internal mind shift, followed up by behavioral shifts. So uh, very concrete, a behavioral shift might be a very good manager who's so used to delivering and doing his, his or her work and meeting objectives. As they shift into a leadership function, they have to move more into um, engaging, speaking, understanding, 
feedback, coaching, mentoring, motivating, asking questions, skillfully asking questions, empathizing, connecting. So taking time, which previously as a manager may have seemed a waste of time. So it's a complete shift, first an internal mindset shift and then backed up by a behavioral shift. I'm hoping, does that answer your question? Uh, this question was raised by uh, um, uh, one person in the audience and um, so uh, in the Q&A box. And um, uh, if, if, if he probably has another question, I will see it in the box. But I think, um, I believe that, uh, that uh, indeed um, uh, you are given a very good answer and a very insightful answer. Um, if um, I, I have a question, if this presentation is recorded, yes, this presentation is recorded and um, you, uh, you can basically see all the webinars at your own convenience uh, if you want to. Um, I don't see another you know, question there, Elizabeth, but I have a question if I may. You basically mentioned in the beginning that both leadership and management are, how would you call it, two competences that uh, a good leader should have given the constant change in organizations that we are in. And I, I believe that that is the case. You made a link to collaborative leadership, but my question is how does collaborative leadership um, deals with or is connected with um, politics in the organization? Ron, can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, um, uh, politics is, is most of the time, you know, people uh, define it uh, some differently. Politics is, you know, bureaucracy or, um, you know, people in an organization that um, uh, want to take the lead but do not know how to take the lead and do it in a different way. So let's say things that happen under the table, under the... Um, uh, the uh, what, 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 in, under the official um, uh, processes and procedures, or if hey, you call it, people want to set a different agenda. So how do you deal with it from a collaborative leadership perspective? Excellent question again, Ron. I'm sure you've been in those situations. And so uh, politics and the unspoken rules, you could refer to politics as unspoken rules. And in other terms, group norms, things that are, are done or a, a way of being and doing and saying that is not explicit. And the only way that you can begin to understand them is to increase the connectivity and the trust between various diverse stakeholders. So understanding multiple perspectives. This really comes right down to a person to person level and uh, building um, building relationships, increasing connection, ultimately building trust. Behaviors that involve um, empathizing, listening, observing, and uh, spending, sp spending time understanding things from other viewpoints and taking the time to observe the way things work. Showing oneself to be trustworthy, understanding what languages and what behaviors speak the most in the organization, and deciding whether we're going to learn the way of being and the way of uh, the way of showing up. Of course, if it goes directly against the grain of our personal code of ethics and the personal integrity, then we may need to reconsider our place in that in that setup. But if it does not, then it would be a question of leveraging differences and um, closing the uh, under increasing understanding and closing the misunderstanding gap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I have a last question. I don't see new questions up there. I'm looking whether I can see there. So I, I probably am allowed to. Um, Having you on the webinar is a, is a, is a uh, an honor and a pleasure. So I will I, I will still ask the question. Um, it relates to um, 
you know, um, a decade ago, we were uh, all companies were looking for strong leadership. And now we are talking about collaborative leadership. Uh, do you see a difference there? Is it something that uh, really resonates in organization? Or is it still a buzzword? And do we, are, are we still looking for the strong man or strong lady? I don't see that that much. Of course, you're looking for the, what I see in organizations, of course, you're looking for strong individuals, men or women, but ultimately the challenges are so complex and the stakeholders so diverse that it becomes increasingly impossible to expect one heroic strong man or strong woman to solve all these problems. So certainly in the companies and the organizations and the teams that I work with, out of necessity, they are looking to share the leadership load and the leadership challenge. And, and that's why this collaborative leadership is not a luxury, it's a necessity, because it's, we're seeing that it's unrealistic and, and um, almost uh, unfair to expect one individual to carry and deal with the complexity of, of the challenges facing leadership today. And so that's why um, with teams that I work with, it's very much about sh everyone stepping up too often you do get one or two strong individuals and the rest to sit back, but they're on the leadership team. So why are you sitting back? You're fully capable of stepping up and stepping out. And so in our engagements, it's every man, every woman, all hands on deck, showing up powerfully, strongly in a way that builds each other up as opposed to in a way that cancels other people out. So that's the challenge yes. that we have and I have as a leadership coach, a leadership team yeah, coach. And, yes, and I fully agree with that. And I like, I really like the connection you make between collaborative leadership, uh, relationship management and emergenetics. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the way you are using it, uh, that I think it's, it, it's great. It's great for others to learn about it. And I, um, I, I thank you for that. Thank you for your fantastic contribution. Thank you for the time spent with us. Um, it's, um, basically we are, we only have a, a couple of minutes to go. So this is the 16th webinar out of 24. Our U S colleagues will take over and going up to the 24th webinar, um, the audience, um, stay on board, uh, be there and, um, in, enjoy the rest of the webinars. Elizabeth, thank you very much again. And our audiences. Thank you very much. Be, we, be Thank assured. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. And all of you, be assured that uh, the webinars are, uh, are recorded, uh, so you can uh, uh, look after them if you missed uh, one of them, uh, again, at your own uh, uh, convenience. And the other thing I want to mention is um, um, we have live tweets during the events, uh, so it's hashtag global 24 hours. Uh, I, are you still there, Elizabeth? No, she's gone. Yes, I am, Ron. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I have another question here that pops up. I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. One second. Um, the question is, what other profiling tool do you recommend for team building, team effectiveness, or do you use Emergenetics exclusively? Oh, I use, there's a lot of good stuff out there. So it depends on the team, but there are a number of things I use. Yes, I definitely use Emergenetic Standard. I, sometimes the teams have already done MBTIs, which is great fun to plot. And we have funny ways of plotting MBTIs using Einstein and, and uh, different, different famous figures in different, different areas of the MBTI plot. And so and we'll put the members of the team's heads on the same, where they fall on that plot. We also use um, Strengths Finder, so we're looking at uh, their, their major strengths themes, and um, we use a number of other ones. I, I'm not sure, I don't want to really go through a whole list, but, but depending on the team and what you're looking to elicit, 
uh, personality, values, emotional needs, um, thinking and behavioral attributes from Emergenetics, but we use a multiple of other assessments that help us rapidly look at the other, the other elements that make us so complex and so unique. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, and thank you to the, for the last uh, uh, person who asked that question.